Clocks and computers, refrigerators and radios, telephones and toasters, big lights, small lights, bright lights, light brights, blow dryers, clothes dryers, curling irons and clothing irons, fans, fast food, planes, trains and automobiles. What do they all have in common? They can't compute or cool or ring or light or dry or cook or drive without energy. From the smallest appliances to the biggest businesses, energy, especially electricity, fuels our economy and our lifestyles. Across the board, people are using more electricity than they've ever used in their life. Uh, they have multiple computers in their home, they have hot tubs, they, have, uh, they plug in their car at night. Uh, there's a lot of electricity demand. And that demand is growing. Consider your own consumption. How many things do you use that demand energy? Um, I use my alarm clock, um, CD player. The CD player, microwave, oven, TV. A TV, VCR, computer, cell phone. Hair dryer, um, lights, lamps, microwave, refrigerator. My refrigerator to keep, you know, my milk cold from every cereal. Now, do you think you could go even one day unplugged? Okay, maybe you could, but imagine doing business with no cash registers or computers, no faxes or phones or lights. We depend on electricity to power every aspect of our lives. As we race towards the future, developing countries may move into the fast lane electricity provides the United States. I think if you're gonna look at the future of energy, it's impossible to look at the U.S. standing alone in isolation. Uh, given the world, the growth in population, the growth in economic, per capita income in the world. People want to live like we live, um, and rightly so. Um, they want a higher quality of life. Uh, when you take that out to 2050, um, you suddenly have nine to 10 billion people on the planet, um, all using large amounts of energy. That's a lot of demand. So how do we make sure there'll be enough power to go around? This is the transmission room at MidAmerican Energy, one of hundreds of power companies trying to answer the question, how will we power the future? It's the focus of debate in the United States and across the globe as countries struggle to balance energy demand against skyrocketing costs and serious environmental concerns. Since the future of energy is really everyone's future, let's explore more about energy, specifically electricity. We'll look at how it's generated, the different resources to do the job, and their environmental outcomes. We'll look at different ways to ensure our energy future by creating greater supply and cutting our own consumption. We'll see how exciting new technologies can change the way we think about electricity. So let's plug in, power up, and explore more about the future of energy. Let's start with some basics about electricity. Well, there are really several steps in uh, producing and distributing electricity. You start really with the fuel source, and electricity is very versatile. It can use virtually any fuel. Uh, so you, you convert that fuel into electricity. Uh, you send it through these large transmission lines. Um, you step down the voltage to a distribution level, and then you distribute it to businesses, homes, malls. Three simple steps generation, transmission, and distribution. First step, generation. The process of generating the actual electricity is pretty much the same from power plant to power plant. What's different is the energy source that's used. Here's how it works. An energy source is used to turn a turbine. The turbine spins a generator. The spinning generator produces electricity. The initial energy source can be anything from coal, burned to heat water into steam to turn the turbine, to nuclear fission, wind, water, even waste. That's generation. The second step is transmission. 
electricity is transmitted over a huge network of high voltage lines called the grid. These lines crisscross our country, taking the power from the plants where it's produced to the points where it's used. Next time you're out driving around, check out transmission lines. Transmission lines are the long distance leg of power's trip from the plant to people. The last step is distribution. Substations and transformers step the power down from the high voltages used to transmit it to lower usable levels. Then it's distributed over lower voltage lines into homes and businesses. Those three steps, generation, transmission, and distribution, provide our power. To power the needs of the future, all three steps will require change, making the entire process more efficient. And efficiency is the key. Efficiency is the key to the future. Experts at the Electric Power Research Institute, a leading industry think tank, believe the most pressing need for change is in the very first step, generation. Given our current technology, given the growth in the world, we're on a collision course with the environment. What put us on that path? Many experts believe it's our reliance on fossil fuels for transportation and for electric power generation. The energy mix in the U.S. at the moment is very heavily weighted towards fossil fuels. For electricity, about 50% of our, you know, the raw fuel, the raw energy for it comes from coal. Uh, another percent is natural gas, so you know it w adds up very quickly that it's overwhelmingly um, fossil fuels. The reason gas and coal are relied on so heavily is simple economics, supply and demand. The United States actually is blessed with the, some of the most prolific deposits of coal um, in the entire world. But if you wanted to use those reserves to generate um, just electricity, there are probably hundreds of years of reserves of, of coal. And all that supply means savings for consumers. The biggest benefit we have by producing coal-fired electricity is that coal is abundant, which means the fuel source is very cost-effective, and that means lower rates for customers in the long run. Even though fossil fuels are abundant and cost-effective, there is a price to pay. Global climate change, smog, acid rain, these very serious environmental problems all get traced back to burning fossil fuels. It's very clear that the carbon that's contained in these fossil fuels um, has contributed to the increase in the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And, you know, it's a measurable, significant increase. You know, most people think about climate change these days, but probably the more immediate uh, problems really have to do with um, acid rain uh, that's formed from sulfur that's in the fossil fuels that we use. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, about two-thirds of all sulfur emissions come from electric power generation. One way to lower fossil fuels' environmental price tag is through technology. One of the most promising parts of, of clean coal technology is the idea that you would take uh, the coal and actually take the chemical components in it in a relatively simple um, reaction and make them into gases. Uh, and then once you have a gas, uh, we know a lot of ways to actually um, make combustion of gases um, very clean, very efficient. Developing these cleaner burning technologies could keep fossil fuels in the energy mix for the future. But EPRI foresees a trend away from fossil fuels. We need to basically accelerate the move away from fossil fuels. Um, it's happening. We're about halfway through a 300-year trend in decarbonizing the total energy system. So we're heading in the right direction, but we may not be moving fast enough. Remember that collision course with the environment? Of course, there are other options for generating electricity. Electricity allows you to diversify fuels. It's one of the advantages of electricity, is that you can, uh, you can take advantage of the sun, you can take advantage of the wind. Um, you can take advantage of the splitting of atoms, nuclear power. Uh, so it allows you to diversify energy. And that's really where energy is going, into a very diversified portfolio of sources. These diverse sources all have benefits and drawbacks, just like fossil fuels. As we look at the other options to generate electricity, keep some questions in mind. Is the resource abundant? Is it available? Is it cost effective? And what are the environmental outcomes of using the energy source? 
Let's explore more about the future of energy. Nuclear energy currently provides a little more than 20% of the electric power in the United States. Industry experts predict that number will grow, despite serious drawbacks like the threat of nuclear meltdowns and the storage of radioactive waste. Nuclear fuel is cheaper than any other kind of fuel uh, that we use for large-scale generation in this country, and it's cheaper than any fuel that we can conceive of at this time. And uranium, the raw resource used to produce nuclear power, is relatively abundant, so it's cheap, abundant, and doesn't contribute greenhouse gases. Safety concerns, then, are really the most serious threat to the future growth of nuclear power. With images of nuclear accidents at Chernobyl and Three Mile Island planted in the public's mind, the industry must convince people that nuclear power is safe as well as clean. Future generations of nuclear reactors could help alleviate concerns. As we look at the, uh, the new designs in the future, they're going to be simpler and safer, more reliable and more competitive, so we can get the environmental benefits of no emissions at a better price. New reactors could eliminate the threat of a meltdown, but they don't solve the problem of radioactive nuclear waste. What will we do with the waste? We won't bury it and leave it there for 250,000 years. Um, my guess is that within 100 years, we'll have the technology to dispose of that in, in very safe ways. So what's your reaction to nuclear power as a resource for the future? A lot of hope for the future rides on renewables, a whole class of fuels that won't run out, and have a squeaky clean environmental reputation. Let's start with a red-hot renewable, solar power. Just as plants convert sunlight into energy to grow, sunlight can also be converted into electricity. Instead of using a generator to produce the power, special converters called photovoltaic cells change the sun's raw energy into usable electricity. Companies like Thin Film Technologies in Iowa are on the cutting edge of solar cell manufacturing, making them more power efficient and more cost effective. Company founder Frank Jeffrey slowed down long enough to talk about some of the cool ways their cells can be used. There's an ex uh, expedition going up Mount Everest that has some of our modules on, uh, mounted on a tent uh, for power, and it's mostly for, for charging the, back, uh, the battery packs for video units that are going up an expedition. So there are a lot of portable uh, type applications. Long term, what we are shooting for is what we call the building integrated market, where the pho uh, photo cells are mounted into the building panels themselves. Mike Kappas runs a music agency in San Francisco. His panels aren't mounted in the roof, but on the roof. We've got 96 panels here. This is actually when it was installed, at least last year, it was the largest solar installation in San Francisco. Um, it provides all of our energy needs, and then some during the day. Um, we don't have storage for electricity here. We don't have batteries that we charge up, so we do draw off the grid during the night. But the net result is that overall, we are generating more electricity over the course of a year than we're using. Um, so we're, su we're actually supplying a surplus back into the grid for California. Which is why, if you look closely, you'll see their meter is actually running backwards. Ask Kappas why solar, and they'll get a passionate pitch for this renewable. Well, somebody asked me about uh, why, do you, why did you go with solar? And I think the question is, why would you not go with solar? Solar energy is created during the daytime only, but that's the greatest time of need for electricity. So you're creating the electricity at the time it's most needed, so we can avoid the production of power plants, we can avoid drilling oil in Alaska or off our coastline, knowing that you can create your own energy with no pollution whatsoever um, for an indefinite period of time. You continue to produce and produce and produce electricity with no, no uh, harmful effect to the environment. I wanted to do that. While sunlight itself is free, there is a cost associated with solar power. Purchasing the PV cell systems can be quite expensive, especially on a scale large enough to produce significant amounts of electricity. Design improvements and increased manufacturing could bring those costs down. Currently, solar power accounts for less than 1% of all the electricity generated in the United States, 
a number Jeffrey, Kappus, and many others hope will increase. Should the sun get a starring role in our energy future? A renewable rapidly increasing its worldwide piece of the energy pie is wind. Wind power has the potential to provide three times the amount of electricity the United States consumes. Currently, it provides less than 1% of all the electricity in the United States. More and more power companies, though, are looking to harvest this energy crop. Wind power consultant Tom Wind evaluated the resource from the largest wind farm in the world near Storm Lake, Iowa. The main benefit of wind generation is that it's pollution free. There are no greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide, there's no nitrogen oxides or sulfur dioxide, no acid rain or smog precursors, anything like that. There's just no air emissions from wind turbines. That's the primary benefit. There are some limits to uh, the use of wind power and the biggest issue is the intermittency. It's the fact that the wind doesn't always blow at a steady rate and sometimes it just doesn't blow. And when that happens they don't generate any power. So you have to rely on other generators that c can be controlled such as coal-fired power plants or gas-fired combustion turbines. Just how much power can these giants generate? On an average day, one wind turbine here will uh, generate about enough power for one home in Iowa for the whole year. One wind turbine one day, one home for the whole year. And if you look at the amount of power that one wind turbine can generate over the year, here in this site, one wind turbine here will generate about enough power to supply uh, four fast food restaurants such as Burger King or McDonald's or Hardee's. One wind turbine will supply enough energy for them for the whole year. Of course this wind farm can harvest all that power because it's located in one of the windiest regions in America. Not every place has such bountiful resources to tap into. And even if the resource is there, not everyone wants turbines sited near them. Will wind power continue to whip up support for the future? Water is another important element used to create electricity. Hydropower creates nearly 10% of all our electricity. It's one of the oldest forms of electric power generation. And while it's well established, there is room to grow. There is a lot of potential out there for hydropower yet to be produced. And um, in the United States, we could probably double the amount of hydropower. Worldwide, there are many resources, especially in third world countries. What are water's strengths and weaknesses when it comes to producing power? As you can see in the plant behind me, there are no emissions. There's no smoke, no particulates, no greenhouse gases. And of course, as long as it keeps raining, it's going to be a renewable source. Hydropower has an economic advantage in that it is relatively cheap to produce. Of course, we have no fuel to purchase, like a coal-fired plant, which much must purchase and transport its fuel. It's also flexible. It can be started quickly, and the load can be changed very quickly. A big disadvantage to building a hydro plant is its initial cost. It's very capital intensive, which means it takes a lot of money up front to build the facility. In addition, uh, environmentally, it can take up a lot of land. If uh, we're forming a reservoir behind the dam, we're going to flood a lot of acres. It can also change the local ecology. For example, if we dam up a fast-moving river, it becomes a pond, and so that changes the type of aquatic life that lives there. Will hydropower make an even bigger splash in the future? Another renewable resource turns trash into treasure. Biomass is anything from leftover crops and weeds to garbage, even manure, all of which can be turned into power. Surrounded by acres of Iowa corn is Beacon, a research facility finding ways to reuse America's leftovers. We're talking about wood chips or switchgrass or corn stalks, uh, actually the corn kernel itself, any, any plant material out there, uh, and we'll try and convert those. And we basically try and convert those into different forms of energy. There's some waste materials in biomass that we can make uh, electricity cost effectively from right now, such as like some hog manure that's a recently processed plant material, uh, out of condition corn, um, waste products like that from the food processing industry where they have waste products that are not very good. We can make electricity fairly cheaply right now from those, but if you want to do it in a big way from things like switchgrass, 
the cost of coal will probably have to go up a little bit to make it economical. Much of the biomass effort at Beacon is experimental, but there are power plants in operation using biomass in combination with coal, or even as their main fuel source, creating a little less than 1% of all our electricity. How big a player will biomass be in the future of energy? Pulling power from deep inside the Earth is another option. Geothermal power taps into the heat of the Earth's core to create electricity. There are only a few places in the world that can take advantage of this resource to produce electricity economically. One of them is the geysers, north of Napa Valley, California. The geysers um, geothermal area is the largest in the entire world. It's 30 square miles with 21 power plants. Like oil wells, geothermal wells drill down into the earth to recover the energy resource. Instead of oil, it's steam thereafter, steam to turn turbines to produce power. The biggest benefit of geothermal, besides the fact that it's a renewable resource that Mother Nature creates for us, is we're saving millions of gallons or barrels of fossil fuels every year. For the 850 megawatts that we make here at the geysers, we're saving 8 million barrels of oil a year from being burned. As far as the costs for utilizing geothermal energy, most of them are in the initial phases. In the drilling the actual wells are very expensive. It's two to three million dollars to drill a well. It's hundreds of million dollars to, dr to build a power plant. Geothermal is so regionally specific, it contributes only a small percentage of our electricity in the United States, just under one percent. Will geothermal power be a hot resource for the future? The final alternative we'll explore more has a lot of high hopes pinned to it, hydrogen. Many experts look to hydrogen as the perfect energy solution, the ultimate clean, renewable resource. Here's how hydrogen-fueled electrical generation could work. A wind turbine would generate electricity, and the electricity would be used to break down water into hydrogen and oxygen. And the hydrogen would be stored in either underground caverns, such as natural gas is stored now, or in big tanks. And then that hydrogen would be used whenever it's needed. It could be used to fuel automobiles. Automobiles are now being developed to use fuel cells, which can use hydrogen. Or it can be used to, uh, in fuel cells for generating electricity for the grid. Solar panels could also be put to use generating electricity to produce hydrogen. It's like that old saying, make hay while the sun shines, but you make hydrogen when the sun shines or when the wind blows. The system could make the most of renewable strong points and avoid their downfalls. Iowa Senator Tom Harkin advocates a switch to hydrogen as soon as possible. It amazes me and, and it depresses me that the oil companies and the nuclear industry has such a grip on this country that we can't break free of that to get the hydrogen system going in this country. The technology is there. We know it works. We can get the price down. Uh, and people say, well, it's too expensive. But what's it going to cost to store the nuclear waste for 10,000 years? And we haven't, fact we haven't factored that in yet. What's it going to cost if we continue to burn oil and, and fossil fuels and the greenhouse gases come and the world heats up and we're going to want to stay cool? What's that going to cost us in terms of trying to live a decent lifestyle? We haven't factored that in yet. So when you look at that, the cost of hydrogen energy becomes very cheap. Hydrogen has been um, the holy grail of energy for 50 years. I mean, people have been talking about it, and everybody understands that's where we're going to end up. But the infrastructure for, for creating, generating, storing, transporting hydrogen um, it doesn't exist. It's going to be a horrendous job to do it. Um, nobody knows quite how to do it yet. Uh, but the, the goal is so great. Uh, the payoff is so tremendous that uh, it will happen. Whether we can get there sooner or not is really the challenge, and I think we need to get there sooner because of the environmental issues. I mean, we've got the planet to consider. Which brings us back to where we started, that collision course with the environment. We've seen that there are lots of options to avoid that crash, but what's the best resource to rely on to generate electricity for the future? Well, I think we should diversify our energy uses, but we should rely more heavily on the energy that doesn't create pollution. Pretty much all the energies that we want to use, there's a problem with how much it's going to cost us to start using it. All of the different resources of energy have um, setbacks, but you want to just 
you just want to start building them. If we switch to um, more, less pollution um, power plants, most usually they don't create nearly as much energy. We'd have to create more um, environmental friendly plants to keep up with demand, but then we'd be taking more then we'd be taking more land. Not all plants have to be on land. You could um, create a, a geothermal plant that's out in the ocean. Probably it would be worth it to um, change our, like, our structure of what we're using instead of gas and coal because it would save the environment. Some fossil fuels, we could just keep using those for a while but slowly cut down and then while we're doing that we could test and improve on alternative resources. I don't think there's any reason to really wait right now to start using our renewables because it's just going to get worse. I would much rather pay a little more for a clean environment because we need a clean environment for the future. Sometimes people get sidetracked on a discussion about, well, is it going to be, um, is it going to be coal? Is it going to be natural gas? No, is it going to be windmills? Is it going to be solar? Well, no, is it going to be nuclear? Which one is it going to be? That discussion is off track because the needs for the future are going to be so large that we're going to need everything. Changing the mix of resources we use to generate electricity and shoring up the system used to transmit and distribute it are important and expensive steps towards ensuring our energy future. Another important step that's absolutely free is conservation. Conservation is critical uh, as we enter a period of uh, a very strong demand for electricity and we understand that there's a delay in the ability to build plants, to generate power and, and to relieve that system. So what, a, what, what everyone needs to do is take, take a look at their energy demand. We're used to consuming a huge amount of power, far more than we need to consume. And probably uh, a mix of reducing power consumption and then mixing the sources is what the final answer has to be. None of them by themselves are going to be the answer. The single quickest, fastest way for us to get the electric energy that we need here is called conservation. That is the fastest. And it doesn't mean that we all have to put on heavy sweaters in the wintertime and turn our thermostats down. It means doing things better and smarter. Who will come up with these better and smarter ways to generate, transmit, distribute, and conserve the electricity we rely on? You. You've got the power to change the future of energy. So the next time you flip a switch, think about everything that had to happen to get you the power you're using. Then, think about all the ways you can help keep that power flowing to make the future of energy a bright one. The program was funded by the Roy J. Carver Charitable Trust, the U.S. Department of Education Star Schools Program, and Iowa Public Television.